uh, epistle lesson is coming from the first Peter uh, chapter 4, and I'm going to read in Korean. 사랑하는 자들아, 너희를 시련하는 것은 불 시험을 이상한 일 당하는 것 같이 여기지 말고 오직 너희가 그리스도의 고난에 참여하는 것으로 즐거워하라. 이는 그의 영광을 나타내실 때에 너희도 즐거워하고 기뻐하게 하려 함이라. 너희가 그리스도의 이름으로 욕을 받으면 복 있는 자다. 영광의 영, 또 하나님의 영이 너희 위에 계십니다. 너희 중에 누구든지 살인이나 도적질이나 악행이나 남의 일을 간섭하는 자로 고난을 받지 말자니와 만일 그리스도인으로 고난을 받은 즉 부끄러워하지 말고 도리어 그 이름으로 하나님께 영광을 돌리라 하나님 집에서 심판을 시작하실 때가 되었나니 만일 우리에게 먼저 하면 하나님의 복음을 순종치 아니하는 자들의 그 마지막이 어떠하며 또 의인이 겨우 구원을 얻으면 경건치 아니한 자와 죄인이 어디 소리오 그러므로 하나님의 뜻대로 고난을 받은 자들은 또한 선을 행하는 가운데 그 영혼을 믿부신 종을 죽게 부탁할지어다 그러므로 하나님의 능하신 손 아래서 겸손하라 때가 되면 너희를 높이 치리라 너의 염려를 다 죽게 맡겨버리라 이는 저가 너희를 본고 하심이니라 근신하라 헤어라 너희 대적 마귀가 우는 사자같이 두루다니며 삼필자를 찾나니 너희는 믿음을 굳게 하여 저를 대적하라 이는 세상에 있는 너희 형제들도 공인한 고난을 당하는 줄을 알미니라 모든 은혜의 하나님 곧 그리스도 안에서 너희를 부르사 자기의 영원한 영광에 들어가게 하시니가 잠깐 고난을 받은 너희를 치니 온전케 하시며 굳게 하시며 강하게 하시며 토를 경복해 하시리라 권력이 세세 무궁포로 그에게 있을지어다 아멘 This is the word of the Lord Como no. 
nosotros. This is the gospel of God. Spirit spoke long ago 
of the mouth of David concerning Judas, who served as guide for those who arrested Jesus. He was one of our number and shared in this ministry. With the reward he got for his wickedness, Judas bought a field. There he fell headlong. His body burst open and all his intestines spilled out. Everyone in Jerusalem heard about this, so they called that field in their language Akeldama, that is, field of blood. For, said Peter, it is written in the book of Psalms, may his place be deserted, let there be no one to dwell in it, and may another take his place of leadership. Therefore, it is necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. For one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So they proposed two men, Joseph called Barsabbas, also known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you have chosen to take over this apostolic ministry which Judas left to go where he belongs. Then they cast lots, and the lot fell to Matthias, and so he was added to the eleven apostles. Now let's pray. Lord, set our feet on solid ground, and let your words go with us in all our ways. From the rising of the sun to the place where it sets, may your name, O Lord, Praise. Amen. Please take your seats. In the holy name of Jesus, ascended and ruling, my dear and treasured brothers and sisters, every one of you, it happened a week ago yesterday, although you may have missed it, if you didn't have a special service at your church. The 40th day of Easter came and went. That's when the risen Jesus went back to heaven as his men looked on. You don't read that his followers cried that day. That's a little odd at first blush. I've watched people cry at all kinds of parties, not just at funerals, but also at retirement parties, or when somebody that you really care about is moving far, far away. And it's hard to imagine a farewell quite as faithful as that ascension day when Jesus was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. And still, the believers don't seem overcome by sadness. And here may be part of the reason. When you back up and read the very first couple of verses of that Acts chapter 1, Luke declares, in my former book, he's talking about the one that we call the Gospel according to St. Luke, in my former book, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day when he was taken up to heaven. I hope you got that. Even though Jesus was ascended, and now was quite literally out of sight, he was not finished doing and teaching. The fact is that Ascension's great Lord is still doing and teaching. That's really the message of the book of Acts, isn't it? It's a powerful message for God's people everywhere at a moment like this. And tonight, as we mark the beginning of our 10th Synodical Convention, we're going to spend a few minutes, I hope, being encouraged by that. The fact is that Jesus Christ has never stopped working among people like you and me who trust in him. The Ascension Day story is at the beginning of that book that we have come to call the Acts of the Apostles. And maybe you noticed in the reading that you just heard, there was this roster of all the apostles who were still present at that time when the Lord returned to heaven. Kind of an interesting thing, really. Of all those apostles who had named there, not very many had their activity recorded in this book that we call the Acts of the Apostles. And even some of the prominent ones who do get reported on, thinking of guys like Peter and John, they don't have the full record of their ministry written down. So I, I actually could understand it very, very well if somebody would come along and object that 
Acts of the Apostles isn't the best title for this particular book of Scripture. That's not really a big problem. Because with all due respect, the Apostles were not the stars who were taking center stage in the book of Acts. And that would have been quite fine with them because they didn't really want to be the big stars. Jesus himself was the big star. And so, in my former book, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day when he was taken up to heaven. That's the way Luke has said. And I repeat, the things that Jesus did and taught when he was walking around on the face of the earth for 33 years were only the beginning of what he did and taught. Even after his ascension, Jesus Christ continued to be the great doer and the great teacher of his people. Before he ever died, Jesus said it would just be this way. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. He who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I myself will love him and show myself to him. And the ascended Christ keeps doing it. He lets people know that he has not stopped working. He shows himself to us. Dear ones, this is not just a vague pie in the sky promise either. Almost immediately after he went to heaven, the ascended Jesus kept doing and teaching among his people. He had told his men not to begin their public work of preaching and witnessing right away. He instructed them instead for a time to wait and pray. They needed to wait until the right moment when God was going to open the door of opportunity to them. They needed to wait until the Holy Spirit would be poured out upon them in all his fullness to equip them for their work. In the meantime, they all joined together constantly in prayer. The task of the Holy Christian Church is not just to get out there and do and produce the way we think of producing, let's say, in the business world. A big part of the church's calling is also to worship and to listen. In fact, the Holy Christian Church always needs to worship and to listen before it will ever be in the position to do much of anything. The Holy Christian Church needs constantly to hear and listen to the message of Jesus who died in your place and was raised again. The church needs to constantly hear and listen to the message of how you approach God, confessing the sins and the failures of your life without any excuse making, and how you throw yourself on His mercy and trust Him to pardon you for no other reason than the blood that He shed when He died in your place. The Holy Christian Church needs to hear and listen to the truth about what's wrong in the world and about how to take the pure Christ to people who need Him just as desperately as you do. The Christian Church must always hear before it can ever speak, must always receive before it can ever give anything away, must always be touched by God before it's in a position to go out and touch anybody else for Him. Well, anyway, during that period of praying and waiting, the ascended Jesus guided His people through a very down-to-earth piece of work, didn't He? There was a vacancy in their midst. You realize that by this point, the number of the apostles was not any longer at the full complement of twelve, but only eleven. That's because Judas Iscariot had betrayed the Lord Jesus then had destroyed himself in the most tragic way. Now the church needed to call a replacement to fill that vacancy. Jesus guided the whole process in the most marvelous way. First of all, St. Peter as a leader got up and quoted words from the Bible to explain how God had predicted Jesus or Judas' downfall rather, and how God wanted them to find a servant who could take Judas' place. And while the assembly was there, pondering, chewing around on these Bible words, Peter laid out very qual the concrete qualifications for an apostle. It had to be a man who had seen the resurrected Lord Jesus with his own two eyes. It had to be one who had personally watched Christ's whole ministry from beginning to end. And then the people did what 
church members nowadays do sometimes when they hear the qualifications for, say, a pastor in a local congregation, they began to scour their memory. They thought about candidates that they knew who were sound and who would fit the description. And we're told two nominations came in. It was a very mundane process. But it was not to be just a human process. And that's why the church prayed. They could identify good candidates, all right, but only God knew the heart of each man. And they could nominate, but only God knew which candidate he wanted. The church trusted God to come and take over their very humble little methods, because these were the only methods that they had available to them. It's possible that they wrote the names on little wooden markers and dropped them into a bowl. One of the old Lutheran interpreters was explaining that if that's the way it went, they perhaps then spun the bowl and then the marker that flew out bore the name of the man that was declared elected. I wasn't there to see it. But I'm glad we have this record in Acts chapter 1. Nowadays, we have our own crude little human methods we call elections, don't we? In our church, for example, we generally place names on a list based on people using their memory and their judgment to nominate suitable candidates. And then we pray to God. We ask Him, please, take over our humble ways and work through our little limitations because these are the only ways we have. You know, if God had wanted to, He could have sent the lightning bolt right through the sky and could have announced the name of Judas' successor that way. Or, I suppose, He could have hung a loudspeaker, you know, on some nearby cloud and broadcast the name of His choice down to the earth. But God chose not to handle it in that sensationalistic way. God chose to work through a very humble, human-looking process. The choice fell on Matthias, and his name was enrolled together with the other apostles. And I can't find any place in Scripture ever giving you the impression that Matthias' choice was somehow suspect, or that Matthias was not quite a full apostle because the process of choosing him had such a humble and a human side to it. People listening to Holy Scripture, people using their sanctified judgment to suggest candidates, people begging God to work blessing through their humble little process because that's the only kind they had available. That was the ascended Christ guiding and doing things in His church. And you know something else that's really quite wonderful? Even the guy who didn't get elected, his name is Joseph Barsabbas, was not a loser. It's true, of course, that he did not become an apostle. But as far as we're aware, he had a fruitful life and a faithful witness, and if the ancients are accurate about all of this, he ended up being a chief pastor in a Greek city. So he too seemed glad to accept the way the ascent of Jesus had guided the whole thing and lived out that heartwarming little saying, I don't know if you ever heard it before, it takes more grace than I can tell to play the second fiddle well. This record of the early days after the Lord's ascension is marvelous stuff for you and me to hear as we begin the Synod's 10th Convention now here in Vancouver. I realize that at first blush it might sound like dusty old history, I'll tell you what it really is. It's fuel to help you rejoice and to take comfort because the ascended Christ is working. Even when your eyes tell you they can't see it, He's working. Even when all the appearances seem entirely to the contrary, He's working. He doesn't just work in toe-tingling stuff like miracles and lightning bolts and voices booming down from the sky. The ascended Christ could also work through lowly things, like that first apostolic call meeting that you've got reported here. And the ascended Christ later on worked through things that looked small and for all the world, for a while at least, looked like failures. All those tiny little groups of people to whom the missionary Paul preached later on in the book of Acts. 
or even those occasions when people seemed to shut out the good news altogether and wouldn't listen and resisted that message the way it went in the city of Athens. The ascended Jesus was working and doing and sowing in those moments too. Before he ever said, Jesus promised, I am with you all the way until the end of the world. And there was that other time that he vowed, where two or three of you are gathered in my name, I'm right there with you. Jesus Christ's presence is built on those promises, dear ones. It is not built on your seed, or your measurement, or your ideas about how your personal life and church life have to look for you to really believe that he's present. His, life, his presence, rather, is built on his promises. And when your eyes and my ideas and our little ways of measuring get in the way, the words of the Bible are right on target. Take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. So, brothers and sisters, you sing your heads off tonight. And when you get home after our little gathering in Vancouver, pray, teach, and baptize, and guide children, and tell of your Christ when God gives you the open door to do it. Do it because of his promise. No matter what your eyes say is happening or isn't happening, do it because the ascended Lord Jesus is still the great doer and teacher among his people. He is the source of all our joy. He's your reason to keep on hoping. He's the energy that moves you forward. He's the forgiver and the restorer who died to cover your sins and who knows how to lift you up again with his word and promise. He's not just a long ago teacher whose dusty ideas we keep alive to try to motivate ourselves. But he is the life of his people. If he were not there, we'd have no joy, no hope, no energy, no rejuvenation, nothing at all that deserves to be called life. But you and I this night have every one of those things because you and I have him. Now there's a confidence to take with you into the talking and the listening and the learning I hope we'll be able to do during these convention days. There's something that's really worth celebrating and not just in a glorious festival service like this one, but everywhere and all the time. May the peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen. In your bulletin now, you're going to turn to page 10, and we stand and confess our holy faith together.
In response to the invitation of our Lord, we join in prayer for the church, for all those in need, and for all of God's creation. Let us pray for the Holy Christian Church on earth. Let us pray for the mission of our synod around the world.
and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who after his resurrection appeared openly to all his disciples, and in their sight was taken up into heaven, that he might make us partakers of his divine life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Oh, 
Christ and his holy precious blood strengthen and preserve you in the Christian saving faith unto life everlasting. Depart in peace. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace.